Now, if you clicked on this video because you saw a catchy title, welcome to the Zenus 750 Super Duty Build and the Kit Plate Enthusiast YouTube channel. Now, I don't know what the title of this video is going to be quite yet, but I'm hoping I can come up with something a little bit catchy. Because in this video, I wanna talk about what I think is the number one skill that anybody's going to need if they wanna build an airplane. So I'll talk about that in just a minute. After that, I'm gonna show you how I prepped these windows and installed them in the side of the fuselage. Now, as you can imagine, there are a lot of skills that a builder will need in order to finish an airplane. For example, if you're building a tube and fabric airplane, some of the skills you'll need to learn are fabric covering, and you'll need to learn how to put on the paint edge tape and how to properly apply the fabric. If you're building an aluminum airplane, uh, you're always going to be making little small brackets. You're going to be drilling holes. You're going to be finishing the edges of the aluminum. It's all relatively simple skills that anybody can learn. But I think the number one skill that's going to be required to build an airplane is the ability to think ahead and picture the airplane as a whole and not just the parts that you're working on. Now, what I mean by that is every single thing you do on an airplane will affect something down the line. And there's things that you need to think about early on because you may rivet yourself into a corner uh, if you don't think far enough ahead. So in this video, I wanna show you some examples of where I did think ahead, and I probably saved myself a lot of trouble. And I wanna show you some areas where I didn't quite think far enough ahead, and now I may have to redo things or disassemble parts, or otherwise just cause myself a big headache. All right, I'll show you some of the examples where I did think ahead. On the Zenith wings, this is the bottom of the wing, and you can see this cutout that I made right here. This doesn't come with the factory kit or it's not cut from the factory, but it absolutely has to be here. You could do it on the top, but either the top or the bottom. Because let's say I didn't cut this, this little opening out right here. There is a bolt that goes right in here. In fact, there's no, not even a hole drilled. I have to drill a hole yet. This is where a tab will come out of the fuselage and this will get bolted to the fuselage. Now, if this wasn't here and the fuselage was flat up against here, as you can see how it is on my cruiser, there would be no way to attach the, the fuel line, which is right here. This gets attached to uh, a nipple on the side of the fuselage. And there would be no way to put this bolt in or put the nut on this bolt. So, if you were building this wing and didn't think far enough ahead and you just riveted all of this together and you had all this done and didn't have a cutout right here, there would be no way to insert this bolt or connect your fuel lines or your wiring or things like that. Now, if you guys have been following my channel for a while since I've built my cruiser, you'll know that I mounted my fuel senders on the top of the tank instead of the side, which is where Zenith mounts them. On my cruiser, when I mounted them on the top, they do stick out past the skin a little bit. So I made these fiberglass domed coverings here, which I just use real small rivets to rivet in place. And I'm doing the same thing on my Super Duty, and I'll show you why I'm actually doing this and why I did it on my cruiser. So the location that Zenith mounts the senders is right here. This is the side of the tank, and they mount a the sender right here. But let's pretend for a minute that this wing is finished and installed on the airplane. So there will be a skin that, that rivets down here, it comes up like this and goes all the way back, it gets all riveted closed, and of course the fuselage is right here. Now let's say that fuel sender starts to leak, or let's just say it breaks and it's no longer sending information to your fuel gauge. How do you change that? Well, you can change it, but you're going to have to remove this skin, which means you're gonna to have to drill out a whole bunch of rivets to do that. Now, if your airplane is not painted, it's not too big of a deal to drill out a rivet, but obviously I intend to paint this airplane and I don't wanna be removing skins from an airplane that's painted. So in case my fuel sender ever leaks or needs replaced, I've mounted it on the top of the wing. 
And this is a little bit different than the cruiser because what's nice about this is since it's mounted on the top of the tank, but it still sits below the skin of the wing. So I don't need to make a fiberglass dome for it. But I did have to make a cutout in the skin for an access panel because, again, thinking ahead, if this ever does leak, at least I don't have to get to it in here. It's on the top of the wing. I don't even have to remove the wing from the airplane to do. And if I didn't cut this opening here, I would still have to drill out all of these rivets where you can see the Clecos there, all those would have to be drilled out to remove this top skin to have access to the fuel sender. So obviously with this opening right here, I can just uh, cut the sealant around here, take the screws off and remove the fuel sender. So again, just thinking years down the road, if I ever have a faulty fuel sender or it leaks, uh, you know, I don't have to remove the airplane from the wing. I don't have to remove any skins. All I have to do is unscrew this access cover and I have access to the fuel sender. Another example of where I did think ahead was with my ELT antenna. Now, if I kind of zoom back here a little bit, you can see where I have it mounted on the top of the fuselage. And as I was building the airplane, I actually wanted to have the antenna somewhere back here. I wanted to have it a, a little bit further back. But what I was worried about is there's an access hatch on the bottom of this airplane. You can see it right there. And I was afraid if I put it any further back, I wouldn't be able to actually reach it from the inside of the airplane. If I stand up in that access hatch, I wouldn't be able to reach back here to install the nut on there or the uh, antenna cable. So I kind of waited until the airplane was built enough to where I could see how far back I could reach. And this is about as far back as I can reach. And so I've put the antenna uh, in that location. If I would have mounted it back here, I would not be able to reach it to install the nut or the cable. Another area on the Zenith airplanes where a builder really needs to think ahead is when they go to rivet on these big kind of rectangle pieces right here. I've seen some builders where they'll rivet it all together and then they realize there's a push rod that goes down from down here all the way up there. And if you don't install that push rod before you rivet this, there's no way to get that push rod in there. So you kind of have to insert the push rod in there, then you can put that cover on and rivet it in place. Now it could be pretty easy to forget that push rod because as this is getting riveted together, you know, usually a builder is just in the middle of, of riveting together an airframe. None of the flight controls or anything are in there yet. And uh, nobody's really thinking about the flight controls. So if you're not really kind of thinking ahead and thinking about the push rod that's going to need to be placed inside there, it's pretty easy to forget. Well, the last one I'll show you here, and I have talked about this before when I was talking about my panel is mounting this GPS. My original plan was to mount a hinge on the bottom of this panel so that the entire panel would fold down so that I'd have access to the back. But I did think ahead enough at least to realize that with this GPS mounted back here, as this rotates down, obviously the back of this uh, GPS will come up. And it would have come up enough to where it would hit this top skin and prevent the panel from folding down. So luckily I thought I had enough to realize that that's not going to work and that saved me uh, from putting a hinge down here and getting too far involved in that when it really wouldn't work. I'm going to make another video on the avionics and wiring and I did talk about this before but if you're new to the channel you'll notice that the I have an avionics rack here and all of the big components if I can squeeze my camera in there, are mounted on the bottom of this avionics rack. And I did that, again, thinking ahead years down the road, if I ever need to change out a backup battery or my ADSB module goes bad or something like that, if I need to change something, you know, don't forget, there's gonna be a skin on here with the windshield here, so there's no access back here. Now I do have access by removing one of these EFA screens. There's only four screws that hold that on and this can come out. Then I've got a nice big hole to get back there. But mounting those avionics on the bottom lets me access everything 
from the bottom side of the panel. And what's actually kind of nice about this Super Duty is it's with these big, huge tires on it, it's actually a really tall. So all I need to do is open the door of the airplane and I can just lean in and work under the panel to remove those components. So I kind of thought ahead as I was mounting these, I was thinking years ahead in the future when I need to access stuff back here, you know, I just tried to mount things in a way that will make it easy for maintenance later on. Now there's probably a lot more areas on the airplane where I've kind of thought ahead and done things a certain way. Those are just some of the examples of areas where I happen to think ahead and thinking further down the line may have changed how I, I've done something earlier. But now I wanna give you some examples and show you some examples of where I didn't think quite far enough ahead and I kind of boxed myself into a corner. You will notice that there is a rib right here on the very inboard part of the wing. And the back flange of this rib gets riveted with these three big A6 rivets. So there's a whole bunch of rivets that rivet on a big stiffener plate back here. Um, but before you put these three in, you know, you need to have this rib in place. Well, if we look at this wing, I was just a happy little riveter riveting all these rivets. And... I've installed these three rivets, but you'll notice this rib is not installed. So I'm going to have to drill out these three rivets in order to put the rib in there and then re-rivet this with that flange behind the rivets. It's not a big deal, they're fairly easy to drill out, but if I would have thought ahead, I would have marked these holes off so I didn't put rivets in there. All right, now let's look at the back of the, my Super Duty here. This is the elevator. And you can see this little steel pin that per protrudes here. This is basically the pivot point for the elevator. And this steel pin gets welded to a, a flat steel, a flat piece of steel behind here that's behind the rib. And you can see the two rivets that go into the steel and then this pin protrudes through here. There is a cotter pin and some washers that go on here. And that cotter pin obviously makes it so that this can't slip out and have your elevator fall off. And so to put a cotter pin through there, there has to be a hole drilled in here. And it's not drilled at the factory, it's up to the builder to drill it. And I didn't think far enough ahead to drill that hole while I had it disassembled. Now the problem I'm going to have now is if I try to drill this now, you know, if I, my drill bit or my drill can't go over far enough because the chuck hits the elevator. Unless I drill it crooked like this, which I'm not sure I could do. The other issue is, this drill bit I have in here is a little bit bigger than a 16th of an inch, but a 1 16th inch drill bit is really, really fragile. If you bend it at all, it just breaks. So, you know, I have to try to drill this hole without bending that drill bit, get it perfectly straight while I can't fit the drill over far enough to drill that hole. So I'm not sure yet how I'm actually going to fix this. The worst case scenario is I may have to drill out all of the rivets around the this rib, remove the rib, drill out these two rivets, and remove this steel bracket so that I can put that bracket in a drill press and drill the hole. Then I'll rivet the bracket back in and put the rib in and, and re-rivet it. I'd sure like to be able to do this without taking this rib off, but uh, that's, that may be what I have to do. But this is a perfect example of not thinking far enough ahead. You know, a year and a half ago when I built this elevator, I just really wasn't thinking about Later on, I'm going to need to put a cotter pin through here, so I never really thought about drilling the hole. So I kind of got myself in a bind there. So just a perfect example of how you really need everything you're doing. You really need to think, you know, a year or so ahead of time if you need to do something now that's going to need to be done later. All right, the last thing I want to show you here is my elevator servo. Now, if you watched, I think it was episode 81, I talked about how I mounted this servo and how I originally designed this or mounted it with a regular servo arm on there. But as I mentioned in the previous video, I didn't think far enough ahead about the actual travel. And with that servo arm, I wouldn't have enough travel for it to work. So this servo now has one of these cap stands on it, uh, which gets me the required travel. And so I have the servo mounted nicely, but one of the things that I didn't consider at the time was the rudder cable. And as you can see, this is the rudder cable right here. And 
look where the rudder cable goes. <laughs> if you can see that, it is riding right on top of that servo, and that is a no bueno. Now the way I'm going to fix this though, I need to keep this servo here because the elevator cable will come kind of right over this cap stand. So I need to have this servo here. And so what I'm going to do is I have this little pulley and I'm just going to mount it right here and lift that cable up about a quarter of an inch. So all I need to do is mount and make a little bracket that mounts on the side of this servo bracket that will hold this pulley right here like that. And that'll get that rudder cable up off the elevator servo. But again, when I was mounting this servo, I just didn't think at all about the rudder cable. I just kind of figured the rudder cable was higher up and it wouldn't interfere at all. And then when I added the rudder cable, <laughs> I see that it's hitting the servo. So again, everything you do, you just got to keep thinking ahead to see if what you're doing will affect something else. All right, well, that's enough of that. My whole point about this thinking ahead was just to kind of show you some areas where I did think ahead and it really saved me a lot of work and some areas where I didn't think quite far enough ahead and now I've got to fix a few things. So the whole point here is if you're just starting your build or you're almost done, always think ahead. Every time you're doing a task, think a year down the road. Is there something you might want to do differently now that will make your life easier, you know, a year from now? All right, with that discussion over, I wanna talk about the fuselage here. Now, the warm weather is almost upon us here in the Arctic of Michigan, and I want to get this fuselage painted this summer. Now, what I've decided to do is I'm not going to be able to install this panel here until the engine is in, because I wanna make sure once the engine is in, all the wiring is complete, and I may have to get back here again. So what I'm going to do is paint the fuselage without that panel, and then uh, I'll paint that panel separately, rivet it on, and then basically I'll just have these rivets right here that won't be painted, which will either look nice like that, or I can take a little brush and paint the rivets, but that's what I'm going to do there. But there's a couple things I need to do before I can paint. The first thing is I need to mount this top window up here. I need to get that glued in and sealed and everything because uh, I don't want to do that after it's painted. The other thing I need to do is get these windows installed and riveted because all the rivets that go around the window, I want to have those painted. But I don't want to put these windows in permanently and rivet them until this top window is in just because this makes a whole nice big access hole to be able to, to work on that top window. So my next thing I'm going to do is get that window installed once that's installed, I can rivet in these windows and then uh, basically it will be ready to paint. Now before I do paint the fuselage, I want to make these fiberglass fairings that go on the left and right side of the fuselage that go around the bottom and a little bit of the top of the horizontal stabilizer. Uh, so you can see on this side, I already have it all taped off. It's almost ready to lay up fiberglass. I just have to put some putty in here to make a nice smooth curve. Um, I do have to tape off the other side yet, but once I get those fairings made, I can remove the horizontal stabilizer and I can remove all these pieces. And assuming that the windows are in, everything here on the fuselage will be ready for paint. And what's nice is I can paint the gear. Once the gear is painted and the fuselage is painted, I can put the gear back on the airplane permanently. I can mount my brake lines. I can paint and install the doors. I can put in this little rib that goes up here. I can put in the top windshield. There's a lot I can finish up uh, if this fuselage was painted. Now at the beginning of this video, I said I was also gonna talk about how I prepped and installed these side windows, but as I'm editing this video, I see that it's already 19 minutes long, which is longer than I want my videos to be. So I must have just been blabbing on about probably a whole bunch of nonsense. So what I'm going to do is all that footage of the side windows, I'll just make that the next episode. So that would be, I think, episode 83, which will be kind of installing these side windows. They're pretty easy to do, but there's some tips I have for you on that. Uh, so that's it for this video. Thank you for watching. Thanks for stopping by. We'll see you on the next episode.